I'm Simon Brumby. Once you probably already know who I, who I am via uh, Facebook and whatever, and some of the things that we do. Uh, yeah, it's a real honor, honor to be here and a privilege to be here uh, representing Kawa and talking about the things that I do. Um, yeah, especially in the times that we're all living at the moment, lots of uncertainty and uh, problems going on. Uh, yeah, so once again, thanks for turning up. It's, uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's nice to see the support of everybody. Um, yeah, uh, we're gonna go over uh, a bunch of different subjects. Um, some of the stuff that is probably already things that you may already know a little bit about as a, a more experienced Digiscoper, but I, I'm coming at it from a different angle. I'm gonna kind of explain why those methods are uh, useful and what benefit it is towards you so hopefully we're not going to be going over too much content that you've already seen uh, in other digiscoping uh, talks and, and things like that i'm going to talk more specifically specifically about my experience and my experience with the equipment that i've got that said um i uh do own cower products but they're not the only products that i've ever used or uh, uh have owned uh, you know i'm a blue collar guy i work for a living like the majority of everybody else out there i just have a, a passion for wildlife and for photography and digiscoping was a great way of combining combining that to uh, share and communicate that with the rest of the world as it turns out but via the social media aspects and, and things like that so uh yeah bear with me if you think that uh things are maybe you've already seen it um, i guarantee that we're going to just spin it a little bit and deliver it all to you in a slightly different way uh, this uh what we're going to be talking about now is also part of the coaching that i offer a uh, one-to-one -one basis or even as a group basis i've never actually done a group but we could sort that out that's not a problem uh so you've saved yourself a bunch of money just by turning up today so congratulations on that um uh Further, you are more than welcome to make, uh, reach contact with me if you wish to uh, uh, talk about some other specific product re related details uh, that refers to you. We can refine all that and bring it to you. Okay, so we are, as stated, all nature lovers. Uh, that's, that's what brings us all together here. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a weird, uh, digiscoping is kind of a, a byproduct, if you will. Um, you know, folks out in the field making images of things that they've seen. Somebody says they've seen a particularly rare bird and nobody believes it in this day and age. So make a photo. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> that's me and some of my friends and uh, a lot of the rest of the Netherlands are enjoying looking at uh, Siberian ruby throats. Needless to say, I was rather chuffed to have seen it as a first ever, uh, first ever for me. So yeah, it's what brings us together. It's the challenge of going out and seeing something special and it, or the excitement of a, a mega super rarity, something that you've you know, never seen before and always aspired to maybe getting the chance to see it. And yeah, it's, th these are all things that are in common for us as Digiscopers, we all relate to this. It's a part of the community and it's quite a strong community as well. So thank you for that. Thank you for uh, being so cool and like-minded individuals. Um, yeah, and obviously the enjoyment of learning new things because uh, you can guarantee that it doesn't matter how long you've been bird watching or nature observing, there's always somebody out there who's got a real speciality in a specific field and yeah, you're going to come across it and it leads you down that path of, of learning things. So yeah, it's, these are the things that what bring us all together. Uh, this is uh, a little bit about, so uh, why me? Well, I've, I've uh, I'm self-employed. I uh, uh, work for a living. Uh, on, in between other jobs, I have a ca camera, a photography, videography business. Uh, I work uh, for Koa as a as an ambassador, which is a huge privilege. Uh, I do some stuff for. Um, uh, Panasonic in the past as well. Uh, I've had several of my, this was, picture was used uh, for a product launch for a, a, a rival scope company. This is my stuff, which are in uh, the Coa uh, catalogs. You've probably seen them all without actually knowing it. So uh, published 
tried and tested. I've done a whole bunch of things, used a various different range of scopes and stuff. And now we're going to dump some of that information on you guys. So hope that's okay with you. I've actually got this place just wrong. So some of our goals for today are take a look at the gear we are using uh, and the techniques used for digiscoping, hopefully dispel some of the myths and stigma that is attached to digiscoping, which is completely unjustified. But we'll talk about that later. Inspiration, I hope that that's coming across now and that you're getting some inspiration to go out and start making some of the pictures your own. And the confidence uh, to use your equipment to the best that you can uh, in order to go out and achieve uh, great looking photos, uh, which is the last be best, better photos. Um, so why did you scope in? It's uh, a, f a funny quirk of technology and timing, but uh, it definitely has its pros. It has its cons as well, but as with all kinds of things. But yeah, so for digiscoping, for me, it was just, I wanted to record things around me and share them. Uh, some, uh, I, I live in the Netherlands. I was born in uh, the UK and it may not seem like such a giant uh, distance, but it is an island, the UK, however big it is. And the flora and fauna is uh, in some places significantly different to here. Mainland Europe, you tend to get a lot more migrants and with uh, the Netherlands being positioned where it is, it can get this time of year. It's, there's actually quite a lot of cool stuff. I just had it with Jeff. There has been a, a step eagle last couple of days, which has got me a little bit twitchy. I've never seen one of those before. Would love to go and see it, but it's vanished. So, so I'm still here. Hey. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I wanted to share these experiences of moving to a different country, uh, I, you know, making new friends, seeing new things, recording it, and then sharing it with other people. So, for instance, here's me with the Eurasian roof owl. Um, yeah, we had a, a year where there was a whole bunch of owls turned up, and they were just in weird places, like on the roof of a house in a estate in the Netherlands. There's me and my uh, uh, equipment proudly, <laughs> proudly pointing at it. Well this little fella, yeah, stripy fluff foot owl, clearly, yeah, hawk to hawk owl. But yeah, again this turned up and uh, I couldn't believe it. That snowy owls and hawk owls you would pretty much die for to get a good, good viewing of in, in the UK and in one year, 18 months, something like that maybe, I was pick, picking these up. I mean, it happens, right? You get an influx of migrants and stuff. So, yeah, you know, maybe you could say there's an element of boasting about it. It wasn't really genuinely intended like that. But, uh, yeah, it was the opportunity to go out and see these things, which you would normally not, not be able to get to see. And with the attributes that a telescope has, you can get crushing views of them, really, really good views, as opposed to sort of, uh, well, we'll talk about other approaches a little bit later on. You know, or, you know, the experience of seeing a rear in a field in the Netherlands, uh, who knew, but apparently there's a small population of them that are kind of running around in uh, one particular area. They're probably, well, they're definitely escapees, but uh, I don't know much more than that. But yeah, it blew my mind. It's a rubbish photo, technically. But it's a great memory. So, yeah, and this is what the digiscoping is about. There's no way you could get close to that to take a, a zoo quality uh, portrait of it. But with digiscoping, you can see that's a rear. You can see that it's the Netherlands as well because of the, 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 the hedgerows and the forest line and stuff in the background. Or the experience I had when I saw my first uh, young pine martin sticking his head out of a tree hole with his little pink nose and stuff like that. So, you know, you can share these things, go out, make great observations as citizen scientists, and that share the information with the people around you or not, depending on <laughs> sensitivity and things like that. But, you know, it's citizen science. Or the time we just went and just fell in love with flamingos in the south of France. Yeah, they're, they're crushingly beautiful animals. Uh, so, there you go. Different reasons, different reasons for doing it. Quite often I found myself uh, sat places observing uh, things and then people will uh, make, uh, ask questions with things like, how far can you see with that? Sounds, you know, or, or what a big lens you've got. And yeah, it, it kind of is a big lens. And yeah, how far can you see? Well, yeah, you can see as far as there's nothing in front of you or the light diminishes. 
So, you know, scopes were designed for this, for viewing celestial bodies. So uh, people will ask questions like, uh, what's the furthest thing away that you've taken a photograph of? Uh, things like that. Um, you know, well, you can remind them that, well, you can take a picture of the moon and that's 384,400 384, kilometers away from the earth. And that's the closest celestial body. I'm really not celestial. Celestial uh, imagery and uh, sky viewing is not really my, my forte. I appreciate it, and the staggering um, awesomeness of the scale of things is it's just yeah, 384,000 kilometers away. Yeah, and that's the closest by thing. So, yeah, you can see the, to the moon, you can see much, much further. But there's techniques which need to be applied to improve your uh, results that you'll be getting for this. So me, I'm happy with that at 250 meters away, that's uh, Martin poop. Uh, so for the researchers that are chasing after the Martins, that's a really good sign that that Martin is, that tree is uh, uh, in use in a Martin territory. Cause that's a, a latrine, or what, the, what, what is how, how it we call it. And that means that this is uh, either a nest tree or a, uh, or a sleeping tree of some description. So you can then see that and then start looking for holes. And if you can't see directly that there's a, a hole in the tree that's um, being used, you can set up cameras or you can set the telescope up and just sit from a big distance from 250 meters away, just sit there and just wait until something sticks its head, head out the hole if you've got the patience for doing that. So yeah, 250 meters doesn't sound like a, a huge amount, but it's, um, you know, you can pick up some really good bits and pieces from it. So the attributes of a scope, they provide enormous potential for viewing things at distance. There are limits to that, but we will talk about that a little bit later on. So uh, what you need to be picking up on now is that this is uh, going to be uh, geared towards um, not, we're all nature lovers. We're all involved in observing and, and wondering at the world around us. And the opportunity to, that's given to us to share this passion with people via the internet is it's a it's a gift it really is so my this what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be looking at it digiscoping but perhaps from a photographer's point of view yeah i know photographer is a bit of a dirty word for a lot of uh, nature lovers but uh you know you're taking pictures through your telescope so the technical elements or some of the technical elements that or uh, govern photography are going to govern your digiscoping as well. So an understanding and appreciation of that will help you make uh, better judgments on the equipment that you're going to use and how you're going to use that equipment to achieve results. Yeah. So, so one of the we're still talking about attributes of the scope and why digiscoping it brings you safely close to things. Yeah, this is on the right hand side. We've got um, uh, a male yeah, Western yellow wagtail singing his head up in a tulip field here in the Netherlands. <clears throat> One moment, please. Just uh, need a quick drink of water. Yeah, that's better. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a male Western yellow wagtail singing his head up in a tulip field in the Netherlands. It's rather cliched shot if i'm really crushingly honest <laughs> but it's a nice shot you know there's lots of color very natural behavior from the animal you can just sit down with your scope and let him go about his business you, you know have, have your little drink or your sandwich or whatever floats your boat and just just wait just watch good field work good field observations that's the things that you learn from being a bird bird watcher being a nature lover you can see that, okay, this guy's coming back to this spot time and time again. So if I sit over here, I've got the sun at my back, he's going to come and sit up in, in those tulips for you, bish, bosh, bash, should have a nice photo. That's the photography elements of things, setting yourself up. There's the combination between nature lover and photographer coming in together perfectly. Uh, orchids. Uh, Love them to bits. They're fantastic things. The, the flower structures and technicality of how they all work, the chemical warfare that some of them apply to uh, enslave pollinators is 
mind-blowing uh so yeah i have lots of respect for them and they they really float my boat uh, and you know they're very susceptible to things like ground compaction so people will want to take macro photography ma macro photos i can understand people want to take macro pho photos macro photography is it's a it's a skill set in its own right and you can re uh, get rewarded with some fantastic imagery uh, with your telescope and a camera you can get near macro to macro sized images from a safe distance so the minimum focusing for uh, scopes depending on uh, your type of scope is between three and five meters so i've got five meters between me and that plant that plant is a compass or compass orchid and it is more or less uh, eradicated from its range with a few uh, very rare exceptions because people go and dig it up and make a drink out of the roots it's really just not thinkable but yeah it's through vast amount of its range in southern Europe it's just gone and uh, this is actually a photo taken on Mount Olympus uh, just at the foothills of Mount Olympus which is where luckily this this incredible plant still grows because uh, uh, there's there's no uh, demand for that drink within this uh within that range where it is and it's protected to hell it's the same level of uh, protection as uh tigers on on CITES. so so yeah brings you closer to the animal to your subject which means that you don't have to go running around after things like maybe you shouldn't be doing so i give you exhibit one uh, this is the sort of thing that i post on my facebook from time to time yeah i can be a little bit outspoken about some things and i i'm sorry not sorry uh everybody wants a photograph of a rare bird black crown night heron in the netherlands is a rare bird uh there's a small population which is presumably escaped or naturalized uh from the uh, zoo in amsterdam and then uh, it just pops up in random places, especially at the end of sort of uh, June, July, when the young, which is what we have here, uh, immature, juvenile, black crown night heron just pops up. And these birds can be wonderfully naive, incredibly naive, and people want to get photographs of it. And it's, it's not field, it's not field craft crawling on your belly towards uh, the bird with your 300 millimeter lens. It's, that's not field craft, that's chasing a bird. And uh, yeah, we all want photos, but there's, there has to be a level, and there has to be a cost, you know. The, the guys that are standing, sitting down on the other side of the path, they're not bothering that bird at all, but the second the bird turns around and starts looking at you and paying notice to you, you're then interfering with that, what that, what that creature is doing. And, and that for me is, is not doable. Um, so people who are laughing at digiscoping and you know why don't you get a normal setup uh, hey this is me uh, on the more or less the same spot where I was where I took the last photo and these are the kind of results that you, you're getting with 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 digiscoping and if you want more zoom you can crop it or you can go from 25 magnification all the way up to 60 magnification but the bird is here and he's fishing and he's blissfully or uh, unaffected by my, by my presence uh, I think that's really important I think that natural behavior and uh, allowing your subject to move results in much much better uh, photographs uh, and images of whatever your subject is rather than something that's uh, you know, scared to death staring at you or running away which is quite often what you'll see is the the backs backs of birds and then birds looking looking back at you that's because it's reacting to you and it's it's moving away and, and you've interfered then at that point so so yes digiscoping is more static it requires uh, a little bit more planning and timing to get your particular shots but this is a really good example of it i knew that this creature was here i knew it was fishing and I knew more or less what side he was fishing. I knew more or less what time of, uh, I uh, used Sun Calculator, which is an online uh, Google Maps resource for planning where your sun's gonna be. And then you can get a better idea of, okay, I need to be there at you know, one o'clock for a couple of hours, because then it's gonna be in the best, best sunlight. And then you come, you do your thing and you go. And it's again, minimal footprint on the environment where you are, minimal footprint. On the creature that you, yeah, you're looking at and yeah 
I've got further detail. I've got veins in the eyes uh, with a telescope and uh, a lot of the stuff that the other guys were getting were really nowhere near as detailed as this. You know, everybody has their own choice to make in how they do things. But, you know, you can't, uh, for, for me, if you start interfering with things, mm, you know, not really much of a nature lover. Mm, sorry, not sorry. So, yeah, and here's another good reason for digiscoping. It, it's magnification. We can have a practical uh, application for that with citizen science. So color ringing projects. Yes, I said ringing, Jeff, not banding. Uh, this, this is a metal ring on a red pole's leg. Uh, and you can get a partial or a full, uh, full reading off that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, Jeff was uh, accused me of old world, <laughs> old world color because I had uh, ringing projects instead of banding projects, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, citizen science, and it's a great tool. It's just something that you can use and can apply uh, uh, when you're out in the field. Uh, it's extra um, yeah, gratification, if you like, uh, knowing that the, you're, you're making some kind of a difference in some way, shape or form by delivering uh, information of uh, tracking birds in the wild. It's really cool. Why not? Yeah. Uh, so you probably have a camera, a mobile phone, or a, and a tripod of some description already. Why did you scope in? Well, it's probably already gear that you've got. So you know, wh why would you want to take extra gear with you into the field? It makes no sense at all. These scopes, coascopes, fluorite crystal, virtually no CA. There's a reason uh, camera companies like Sony, and Canon and Nikon, their most expensive lenses, and we're talking lenses that are tens of thousands of pounds or euros or dollars in some cases, use fluorite. It's because it's fantastic material and it makes for great optics. And the coascopes are, have been using that for a, a long time. So, you know, don't worry about... Um, uh, being pressured or feeling pressured to, to do one or the other. Digiscoping requires some practice, it requires some patience, and it in some cases just a little bit of understanding. And once you start to get to grips with these elements, you can combine it. Don't let people tell you that you know digiscoping is a is a second class option or something like that. It really annoys me. <laughs> During the start of digiscoping, I was often pointed out that it would just be easier to use a traditional camera lens setup. I was like, yeah, mm, yeah, yeah, you're walking around with a tripod and um, look, this is the gear that I had. Blue collar guy working my nuts off <laughs> and I bought a scope and I bought a camera and I bought a, the stuff that I could afford. I was bird watching anyway. I was looking at wildlife anyway. So I, I bought a good scope. Well, actually, I bought a not so good scope to start off with. And then after a couple of years of pretty intensive use, I decided that I could, the images that I was generating were worth upgrading to a top notch scope. So, and actually, if I'd have had the money right at the start, I would have just got the, one of these scopes straight away. Uh, and I would have saved myself a lot of money. You, it's, uh, you get into this sort of uh, downward spiral of blame the gear, blame the gear, blame the gear, blame the gear. Don't blame the gear. Uh, an awful lot of the things that are happening and uh, the image faults, image qualities with your digiscoping, take ownership of it and accept the fact that you're probably making mistakes. And that's okay because everybody does. And that's how you learn things. You make mistakes, you go out, you repeat, you get it right. Or maybe you make some more mistakes, but eventually you'll get it right. So don't let anybody tell you that digiscoping or branding photos that you're making as branding them as digiscoping and going, oh, it's an okay image for a digiscoped image. That's nonsense. That's a lot of stigma which needs to go. Uh, the images that you're creating, you should be proud of. Take ownership for them. Understand that, you know, there's always... Uh, um, a top end and a bottom end of, of what you can and can't achieve with the particular equipment you've got. But 
if you understand how the things work together, you can start to achieve better results with the gear you've got. So I'm just going to take another quick uh, sip of water. So <clears throat> recap, why digiscoping? <clears throat> yeah, enormous focal length speaks for itself. Yeah, how far, we, how far away was the moon? 400 and something thousand kilometers. Yeah, it's insane. More reach than you could get with a traditional camera and lens setup for an affordable price. So for instance, we'll go into some of the uh, stats and numbers a little bit later on. But if you look at, um, a, let's say, a top of the range Canon camera, a 1DX or yeah, 1DX. Yeah, 1DX Mark II and the 600mm uh, Mark II that they've got, that F4 Prime, that's going to cost you hmm, 12,000, 14,000 maybe, something like that. And a scope's going to put you back, what, 3,000, and then you can use your mobile phone to take images. Clearly, there's not going to be um, a direct comparison in what you're producing. But if we're talking about you just need magnification, to get photos of things that are far away, a scope is gonna trump any combination any day because that's what they're made for, yeah? So why did you scope in? I need to picture, take photos of things that are quite far away. It's gear that I've already got and I don't really wanna splash out $1,200 on getting a, a new full frame setup, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it allows me, I respect my nature and I respect the things that are around me and my fellow birders and I want to, remain at a distance that is comfortable for myself not endangering myself and it's not endangering my subject so and yeah i enjoy that intimate proximity uh, that you get whilst you're looking through a scope so yeah that's uh, I, I haven't actually talked about that a little bit but with telephoto um uh there's a, a, a feature which brings the background closer to the foreground so as you're looking at your subject it looks like they're quite close to each other but it also has the same effect of sucking you there as well because everything looks closer than it is so when you're watching your, your waders that are just dab uh, dabbling away or pro probing in the mud it feels like you're right next to them when you're still and you're just looking through that scope and you're just concentrating on your focus and you're just listening to the shore and the wind in the grass and things like that and you're totally zen in that moment it, it's good for you digiscoping is it's just good for you man it put, puts you right there with the with the things that you that you, you love it clears your head out so why digiscoping it's good for you as well low impact top quality lenses and it's affordable it's probably already gear that you already have in in, in all honesty so we'll talk a little bit about the the setup now um, and I'm, again, I'm going to come at it from my angle, from Simon angle, if you like, and just uh, put some little twists and explain some of the features and, and facts of why the various things work together and in, in how they work, especially from a, a photography side of, uh, of, of things. So here you have three of the Kawa lenses. This is the 55, the 88, and the telephoto lens unit, which would I use. So you've got a, a 55 millimeter, an 88 millimeter, and I think that's an 89 millimeter. It's slightly larger than the 883, the, the, the lens on that. And what does that mean? You know, does it make a difference? I don't understand. People are splurging numbers. Yeah, well, okay, so a bigger lens in the front effectively lets more light in. There are other things that govern the performance of the of the various glass but effectively if you've got a big window it lets more light in than a, a little tiny window so that's that's the, the the real basic of it eyepiece they are um uh, governing uh magnification and your exit pupil and the angle of your uh, uh, exit pupil as well which all important and we'll talk about them in a moment or two so here we go this is the the, the 25 by 60 wide angle zoom and uh, it's the wide angle is the important part here um, 
So, and what 25 is uh, the lowest magnification, 60 is the highest magnification, obviously. Yeah, so that's your magnification. Uh, as your zoom goes up, your field of view goes down. And as the zoom goes up, the amount of light coming through also goes down. Things to bear in mind, sounds fairly straightforward. It's gonna have an effect on your photography. We'll talk about it in the next couple of slides. Uh, your exit pupil and your eye relief. Um, yeah, exit pupil is uh, an eye relief. If you go back to uh, talk to the first webinar that we did with Jeff, Jeff did some fantastic um, explanations of uh, these kind of things. I'm not gonna go over it now. Go back and have a quick look at the, the explanations that Jeff give, uh, gave, they were fantastic. So your angle of, uh, what do we call it here? The exit pupil, yeah? So if you think of your exit pupil as a cone, uh, your camera lens will also be, your field of view is also a cone. So if one cone is w wider than the other one, it's gonna see on the outside of that cone, effectively. Your center is uh, uh, in the middle, your, your sharp image is in the middle, and the cone goes out in, in a flare. And what you need to do is these cones to match, and then you've got no vignetting. If one's seen, more of the other one, you get either vignetting because you're seeing inside the eyepiece or you're seeing outside of the eyepiece. And you can't see outside the eyepiece, what you see is inside of the scope, obviously. So that's your vignetting. Your options are at that point are to either try a different lens on the front of your camera, which has a, a greater or lesser uh, field of view, or check your eyepiece for your scope. Uh, if you've got a wide eye, wide angle eyepiece, you shouldn't be having any of these problems because it's, it's broad enough to it, that any objective lens which is coming up against it should be, should be accommodated quite pleasantly. So if you see in vignetting, you need to think about either where the positioning of your eye relief, where the positioning is from the front element of your camera to the, uh, uh, the uh, image on the back of the eyepiece, or you need to make sure that you've got enough angle on one or the other so they fit snugly within each other and then you get a non-vignetted image. So useful focal lengths to remember for uh, full frame APC and micro four thirds are 50, 30 and 23 millimeters. Yeah, uh, at those focal lengths, that's if you're using a lens on the front of your camera for digiscoping, you uh, then have no vignetting. Uh, with mobile phones now, uh, they have these two times zoom and they're all about 35, I think, between 25 and 35 uh, millimeter equivalent, but you can find that out in the data on your mobile phone sheets. And th they're ideal, they're what you wanna be using, and then you don't get any um, vignetting with those things. But as explained here underneath, it depends a little bit on the eyepiece and the scope exactly. Uh, it might be five millimeters either way or something. So facts to know. Uh, facts, angled versus straight scopes. Yeah, long and short of it. It's just use whatever you're comfortable with. I mean, really, I use the straight scopes. I'm quite happy having a straight back and looking straight through, through the scope without having to bend over all day, get a stiff neck, stiff back. I don't really need that. I'm quite happy to keep straight back straight neck and just just view that suits me and um, because i'm digiscoping quite a lot uh, i find it more um uh logical in the way that you locate your subject so you're like same with binoculars you know you're looking straight through and your subject's right in front of you uh, with this angled scope you're looking down a little bit and then it's coming out underneath you so it's a little bit less intuitive. What is not shown in those two, uh, two pictures over here of the, the coescopes is that there is actually a little groove on the, the front of that uh, lens cap, which is, acts as a, a sight. So for helping to quick sight things in is you can either use, let's uh, get something here. So that's the top of uh, one of my tripods. And if you use the top of that as if you use use the top of that, use the top of that as one of your sights, if, like you would do a, a gun sight or something. When it's flat and level, you know you're looking directly at it. So even though it's angled and you're looking from here down, 
you can use the straight through method to get your target in, in sight relatively easily. And also that little notch on the front of the, um, of the scope, that will also assist with that. One second, there we go. So don't be torn either way. Don't feel like you've making a, made a bad decision. If you're comfortable using an angle scope, you, congratulations, you've got an angle scope. <laughs> well done. You're the guy, person, girl, guy, girl, that's gonna be using these, these pieces of equipment for the next uh, 10, 20 plus years. Uh, uh, you know, just get what's comfortable for you. It's really important that you're comfortable uh, to be able to get that kind of confidence to go out and use the equipment that you're using. So, uh, man, we'll talk briefly about adapters. Kawa have a full and expansive range of uh, pairing almost any camera to almost any of our scopes. And I'll stand corrected on that if that's not the case, but in general, you're looking at the PA7A, the DA10 and the DA20. And the DA, uh, DA10 I use quite regularly and the DA20 is for the little, the 55 scopes. If you don't fancy them and you wanna go with a third party scope, I cannot speak highly enough about Paul Sayers Digidapter. It is, in my opinion, the best third party uh, adapter out there. It's beautifully machined, beautiful, simple to put together, simple to use, and it's solid. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, in a nutshell, they're your choices. But uh, don't tell a Digiscoper that they can't do that. Yeah, so we talked about eye relief and uh, angle field of view from uh, from the back of your eyepiece. This eyepiece on this uh, this old scope has a it's not a wide angle. It, it's a very it's a standard field of view, so it's maybe half the uh, half or I don't know the exact uh, numbers. So we'll just say it's less. Uh, yeah, the field of view that you're getting from this is less than what you'd be getting with a wide angle, and that causes vignetting so you put any camera up against that and you'll get vignetting 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 unless you zoom this gentleman had a bridge camera because that's the camera that he's got and he can zoom up to a thousand times magnification before it goes through the scope and then he gets no vignetting but he has a hell of a time holding it steady especially when he's on the coast but yeah don't tell these scopers that you can't do things it gets the backs up uh, and you know we'll go out there we're a hardy bunch and we'll prove uh, whoever that person was that said that we couldn't do that or shouldn't do that we'll prove them wrong so yeah uh, thanks thanks to the gentleman there for coming to me at bird fair with this it was fantastic it was great to see it oh what one feature of this that metal plate swaps up to cover his eye so when he's uh, looking at the coast uh sea watching he can keep both eyes open so he wasn't getting eye strain as well. Yeah, uh, the mad geniuses, digiscoping, there is definite mad genius uh, attached to it. So you all know that already, I'm quite sure. So thanks. Um, stability, super important. Think about the magnification that we're using here, the kind of focal lengths. Uh, it's crazy, uh, it really is. So tripods and other supports. Huge uh, recommendation, of course. This is the link to my uh, video on my website, which I did with uh, Mark Hoskins from Ben Rowe. He's worked for uh, Manfrotto, he's worked for Gitzo, and he's currently uh, with uh, Ben Rowe uh, selling their equipment. And he talks very, very honestly about the uh, pros and cons of uh, various pieces of gear, ca uh, carbon versus metal versus wood. Uh, we talk about tripod heads and stuff, so I don't have to take your time up very much now with that. Just go check the video out and have a little watch. Uh, yeah. So tips for tripods that weren't in the video. Most of your tripods have got spikes on them, on the feet. If you're on grass, you're on soft ground, use those spikes. They make a, enough of a difference for you to think now, why have I never done that before? Uh, if I'm on grass now, uh, I'll just use, uh, I'll use the, tr the, the spikes all the time. They uh, dig in and just add a little bit of extra security, a uh, little bit of extra stability to the base that, that, that we're working on. So extend the legs from the lower section first. That sounds really logical. Uh, I don't have a tripod to hand, but uh, if you extend, if you've got a, two sec a three section leg, there's a lower section, middle section, and then the solid section, extend the lower section first and then put your tripod down. And the reason for that would be, then if it's not high enough, you don't have to lean all the way down, 
to get the next section out, you can just undo the middle ones and just gently lift it up a little bit so that you're at the correct, uh, correct height for yourself. It's a really good practice and a lot of people just kind of smash it all together, but always extend your tripod legs from the, un from the underside first, the small end first. And uh, yeah, go as big as possible uh, for stability reasons. We talked about that in the video, so I won't go about it here. Personal preferences, no central column. Uh, I don't shoot uh, from uh, bird hides. I've used photography hides, and then I've got room for my tripod anyway. But bird, I, I have, I hate central columns on tripods. They just, uh, if you're not getting your tripods regularly maintained, and um, the collars and the knots and things are not regularly being replaced as and when needed, you just get a little bit of extra wiggle in there. And then when you're trying to position your scope and camera into, into where you want it to be, you're missing shots and uh, at the end of the day, it's really quite sad. So uh, yeah, that's my personal preference, preference is not to have a central column. You may find other ways, fine, whatever, that's all good. Uh, video heads. Uh, that's also, I, I, I love them. They're, they're solid, they're reliable. Again, they will need, uh, like all of your equipment, all the tripods and things like that, they get smashed around and they're gonna need some maintenance. So get them checked out every you know two years or if they got really heavily used uh, more than that. Uh, I like the fact that they're all adjustable and you can set them to exactly where you want. And half bowl, okay? You know what a half bowl is, anyone know? get back to this thing so uh, instead of a central column what some uh, some of the video heads will have is a, a half bowl or a half ball yeah and then the legs have a bowl on them and then what you're doing with this is the bowl sits into the ball sits into the bowl and then you can set your legs up straight or reasonably straight and then use the spirit level which is on here use the spirit level which is on there this particular model has a little light on it which you can't really see because of the studio lighting so then you can level your ball your, your bubble wherever you need to be and for video, that's really important because you're going to be panning to the left and to the right and up and down, and you need a level base to work from. So that's my personal preference is a tripod set up like that. Excuse me. There we go. Moving on. Uh, tripods are not the only answer. Beanbags are super useful. I've used them many, many, many times. They cost nothing, and you can just leave them in the car, and if you need them, they're there for you. So uh, yeah, you can use them for on top of your car. I've had several occasions where using your car as a blind and you just need a little bit of extra height. So you'll drive uh, in front of your subject, open the door on the backside of the car as it were, step out, set up on top of the roof of the car and then you can shoot over the top of your car to get some extra st stability off it. It's not perfect, but it will definitely work in a pinch. And if it's something that's worth taking a look at, then all the more, excuse me. And the other option is, of course, is if you just set them up on the ground and then you're looking straight eye to eye at your subject and that makes a fantastic engaging image. So bear them in line. Now we're going to talk a little bit about focal length. Some of the next stuff is going to be a little bit techy, but the idea is just to give you a, an understanding of how it all works together. <clears throat> uh, so when you're picking faults in your own images and you think, oh, I've got a, an issue here, you can go back and think, okay, well, how, what, what was my technique like? What was I doing? So we'll talk about focal length. I'm gonna put that down, <laughs> stop playing with the uh, things. Uh, so your focal length is your crop factor times your lens, if you're using a lens, or it's 35 millimeters or th 35 if you're not using a lens. So it's crop times 35 times magnification. And that gives you focal length equivalent. Yeah, and you can see it there. Micro four thirds is a two times crop. I've got a 25, 20 millimeter lens on the front and I'm using it 25 magnification. So micro four thirds calculation would be two by 20 by 25, which is a thousand millimeters 
okay? If you're magnifying your subject at the same, uh, when you're magnifying your subject, you're magnifying all the imperfections in the lens, hence buy a good scope and use good lenses on the fronts of your cameras, because otherwise you're just gonna be magnifying every single little imperfection in that. But you also are magnifying all the imperfections such as heat shimmer, wobbly scopes, we've just talked about stabilization, and also they're all also magnif magnified. So good tripod and head will improve subtly the amount of shots that you're getting. So, uh, you know, if you're using some old rickety sticks, uh, that's fine. You might want to get them uh, maintained, overhauled, and then people can uh, fix up all the joints and things so it's a little bit stiffer and it's not quite so shaky as what it was. It will make a, a difference to what, to what you're doing if you're uh, really pushing for better images all the time. So, but why is focal uh, length even and, and considered? Well, the longer the lens, focal length, the more stability becomes a factor in making sharp images. The more you're going to need to consider stuff like weather conditions, heat. Yeah, that's heat shimmer and stuff. Yeah, in the middle of summer here, it's not so much, it's a, it's a consideration, but for seven months a year here, you're struggling to get fast shutter speeds anyway and it's not because there's too much heat it's just because there isn't enough sun so then you need to know where is the sun is it illuminating my subject or is the lighting pleasing for an image that i'm trying to create so the standard uh, advice is, is make sure that the sun is directly shining upon your subject that's no use in the middle of the day if it's 12 o'clock at the day and afternoon the sun's hot you're going to magnify all of the horrendous shimmer and yeah it's just not going to work so just bear these things in mind and how they're all going to work together wind is an absolute oh my god wind wind and oh my god wind netherlands mm, yeah it's windy uh, a lot of the time there are all kinds of weather with wind it doesn't matter weather sun wind rain wind wind with wind snow with wind uh sun with wind yeah you get the idea yeah, sometimes we have days with no wind, but it's it, all things you need to bear in, in consideration. So focal length, sensor size, crop factor. What effect do these have on your images? So we'll take that entire image as a full frame image, which with the full frame colored border. Then in the, cent the center, you have the APS-C size border and the yellow is the micro four thirds. We talked earlier about uh, field of view. Yeah, so you have Full frame, it's a large sensor. It gives a much wider angle. Then you have APS-C. It's a slightly less wide angle. And then micro four thirds is even less again. So your scope is still providing that full image field of view, but because you've got a crop sensor, that image is coming in and then you're just using this center part of that image, of that, of that view, field of view that's coming through your scope. That's what you're looking at. So it's, this is what's coming through the scope, but because it's being projected onto a smaller sensor, you're just getting a, a, effectively, if you were to take an image and then you were to magnify it to 100% and crop it, that's similar to what the crop is doing. So it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's just something to, a characteristic to bear in mind when you're putting your gear together and how your gear is gonna uh, interact with all the gear and all the subjects. So micro four thirds will effectively give you the most magnification because it's got a two times crop factor. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? You can decide for yourself. Full frame gives you the least magnification. Yeah, but uh, you're still at a thousand magnification or thousand magnification with some of the adapters or more depending on what you want to do make your own decisions on the gear that's being used. So here's some examples. On the left-hand side, you have uh, the gull on the cliff. That's a, uh, like a 35 millimeter view. And at full frame, 25 by magnification, it's a thousand millimeter equivalent, so you get a view like that. So it's the same bird, same lot, rock. Uh, you're just looking at it from the different magnifications. Tw tw APS-C, you know, it's cropped in, more magnif magnified. Micro four thirds, 2000 millimeters. I mean, it's the effect that that equipment's gonna have on your gear. So at 2000 millimeters, you're starting to struggle to hold things down. 
uh, look at on the, the left hand side image there there's a little bit of white a little bit of chop on, on the water things are blowing even on a pretty nice day in Anglesey like that it's still going to be difficult to hold things every, completely steady and once you start losing um, your stability at this kind of magnification you'll start getting shake and that shake will result in soft images so again good telescope is that much magnification necessary with with that adapter probably not you'd probably be better off taking less magnification and uh, cropping the image to the size that you want there's enough megapixels in the sensors anyway this is complete flip end this is all at 65 uh, 65 mag uh, 60 by magnification full frame APS-C and micro four thirds. So that's 4,900 millimeters if you're just using the, the standard adapter with it. It's crazy amounts of um, uh, magnification. You can still see this detail in that image. You know, you can see the eye iris, you can see the, the little bit of discoloration in the bird's eye. There's still feather detail through there, but it's, it's really pushing uh, the limits of uh, the equipment you've got. And at this point, you have to start thinking, okay, well, uh, what do I define? What am I expecting from my images? Is this a nice enough image? A nice image? Is this the, the kind of quality that I want to be, be delivering? You know, sometimes you've got to be, just be realistic, make your expectations and go, okay, it's, uh, you know, 38 millimeters, it's 38 meters away and it's blowing. I'm probably not going to get a show stopping image, but I'll get a good uh, in fact, you, you could ident identify uh, characteristics like eye color, which changes with age and things like that. The uh, size of the red patch on the, the bill, uh, you know, you can count, start looking at feathers in the, you know, its uh, plumage. So it's more than adequate for a good identification if you thought it was going to be something that was maybe a little bit rarer than... Uh, than your standard uh, seagull as it was. So quick note on these things. If it works for you, fine. Yeah, that's the long and short of it. You, you wanna use a mechanical trigger release, you wanna use a radio trigger release, you wanna use the Bluetooth uh, controller for your camera app, fine, use it. If you're happy, it works for you, you're uh, producing more stability in the images you've got, therefore improving the, the, the amounts of, of good shots that you make him so if it works for you use it am i how are we doing for time okay it's uh clocking on but uh yeah quick setup uh in general uh did we skip one here yeah cam camera setup yeah aperture mode or manual mode if you're happy with that uh wh why you start using manual mode is once you start appreciating what the actual uh f-stop of the uh, scope is and uh, the shutter to speed relationship. We'll talk about that in, in a little moment. I'm just going to tweak this. Uh, center, of sp center or spot metering, depending on your subject. If you've got a subject that's filling the frame, spot metering is fine, uh, uh, or, or, or rather center is fine if it's filling the frame or almost filling the frame. Uh, uh, if your subject is maybe just, um, set off to one side in the image, you might want to use spot metering and then move your spot over to the location where it is in the frame. Multi-shot shot mode, digital cameras, shoot, 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 delete the rubbish that you don't want. Raw files are better than, uh, than JPEGs. Uh, you're gonna have to figure out for yourself whether that's good advice or, or not. The, the files are, better as raw files but if you are not having any if you're having issues you're still using old equipment uh for processing and things like that and you've got issues with deep handling lots and lots of raw files then just use jpegs what, what works for you is the most important thing the whole experience should be enjoyable so uh if you're shooting in J, jpeg check your white balance it's not so easy to correct uh, uh in jpeg as it is in raw so with raw files, uh, there's a, an awful lot more data, which gives you an awful lot more leeway for correcting things later on. So JPEG, check your white balance, get it right the first time. Once you've got it right, it's, it's, it's done, right? Exposure compensation, uh, you can use that to gain a little bit of SS, uh, shutter speed. Use your histogram. I know a lot of people don't use the histograms. Uh, we can hopefully do some more stuff about that in another 
I, I want to do a couple more uh, uh, mini workshops. Uh, one uh, regarding uh, cinescoping, vid vid basically shooting films with uh, through a telescope uh, with your various equipment, and I'd like to do one on um, uh, like Lightroom processing stills um, just a, a bit of a basic base blast to improve everybody uh, improve everybody's uh, understanding from a beginning level up to like medium level uh, for using that kind of stuff uh, so yeah check your white balance to start off with use your histogram well histograms are super important and useful tools for getting your exposure correct zebra stripes they're built into all the panasonic cameras uh, they you start getting stripes on your screen if you haven't seen it before just go and quickly google zebra stripes so focus peaking very similar tool super useful i know people who have uh, glasses have issues sometimes seeing the backs of the screens and things uh so just use the focus peaking and 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 then uh you don't have to smudge your nose right up against the camera you can actually use the backs of the screens and things for uh getting a, a better focus uh, focus is a real important part of getting good images i mean it sounds so silly but if you've not got good focus you you, you haven't got an image or un unless you've chosen not to do that which also sounds weird but it is <laughs> if you choose not to put um uh, a, sh a sharp image in we can talk about that another time custom memory sets program your camera so that you it's all the things that you use are to hand so you want to check your zebra stripes you want to check your focus peaking you can turn them on and off really quickly customize your camera all your cameras are, are, are capable of doing that so uh, use it i uh, want to change the video mode click click okay 4k 6k whatever pre-roll 4k and 6k photo modes it's criminal that there's so many people using the GH4s and GH5s and are not using 4K and 6K photo modes for, for stills. Sure, you're shooting in, in JPEG, but uh, the pre-roll thing, I might do a, a little one-off video about that and where that all came from. It's a fantastic tool. It is an unbelievable tool. I, I, actually, I saw that there's pre-roll on the latest software on my uh, mobile phone, which kind of blew my mind. So uh, things, things to look at. Aperture mode, mode is the most commonly used mode for digiscoping. Your camera's being told that the aperture is something that it isn't, and therefore you're getting faster shutter speeds. Faster shutter speeds means less motion blur and potentially sharper images, more detail Im images uh, that you should be creating. So. In general, any camera will do that it, it really well. People have been making fantastic photographs for some 200 years. And, you know, you look at these old images, they're still fantastic to this day. So a good photo is a good photo. Don't get hung up on gear. What I'm saying is just learn to use the gear that you've got. And then you can make decisions based on, is it the right gear for me? Or uh, am I doing something wrong? once you understand what it is that your gear is doing. So all cameras have pros and cons, understand these and they'll help you utilize them better. Full frame cameras have better ISO handling generally. A larger sensor means that the heat dispersion is better than what it is on micro four thirds cameras. Micro four thirds cameras suffer somewhat with, uh, with uh, uh, noise levels. It, don't get hung up on noise levels whilst we're here about this. Uh, it's really a thing of the past. The software, like Topaz software and uh, Lightroom software, I think you can annihilate most of the noise that you've got in your images. So don't, if people are saying, oh, I don't like such and such a camera, the noise is not good. Yeah, silver nitrate, anyone? Anyone ever shot silver nitrate back in the day? No, no, 200 years ago, silver nitrate photos. You're gonna tell Ansel Adams that there's too much noise in his films? And his, his photos, good luck. A good photo is a good photo and it'll stand up. Learn to use your gear. That's the most important thing. Uh, yeah, many newer phones have two, two by magnification, eliminating vignetting, as we've already talked about. DSLRs with the shutters tend to have shutter shock. It's a bit of a, an issue with some models. Micro Four Thirds do, less, do a lot better because they're a lot lighter. There's less weight hanging behind. They're fantastic tool sets, the, the, the 
Lumix cameras. Uh, the amount of stuff that you can do with them is, is insane. And that's what your camera is. It's a tool. You learn to use your tool. Explore it, explore with it, experiment with it. Go through. I know that most men are very guilty of never reading the manuals and stuff like that, but it's the amount of stuff that's in these modern cameras is, is insane. It's really good. Compact cameras, anyone uses them, four by magnification is fine. So this is coping with a camera and lens. Why? Speed booster effect. Effective faster shutter speeds equals sharper images. You got that, right? We've talked about that previously, why that would be. Your magnification, you, you want your camera to be still to make that sharp, crisp image. So understanding aperture, body and lens method. Digiscoping trick the camera into thinking the aperture is actually faster than it is. Uh, so the best reason. So the 20 millimeter pancake lens for these micro four thirds. So I'm going to talk a lot about these uh, micro four thirds cameras because they're what I use. And it would seem, uh, although I know how to use the other cameras and uh, the things that they have in, in relation to digiscoping, it would, uh, be remiss of me uh, not to talk about the gear that I use. So uh, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm making no apologies for that. There's a million different ways to skin a cat, but the principles here are the same for any other digiscoping system that you've got. So 20 millimeter F 1.7 is very, very fast. It's also a small little wedge of a lens and it fits beautifully in between um, your camera, your camera and your rest of your system. So, Scope's aperture is around f5.6 for an 80 millimeter plus minus scope. That's the objective lens that we're talking about. Any scope with 80 plus min uh, is around f5.6. F so that means uh, with your lens on your camera, you could shut that down, the aperture down to f5.6. Any lower than that, and you'll start getting vignetting. But why would you do that when you can shoot at f1.7? It's very, very fast. Um, I am just going to skip this one just for a second. Then we're going to go to this representation. So uh, we're going to look at the size of aperture. People say F5.6, but what does that mean? Look, we've got a little spot there right in the middle. That's F.56. If you think about the aperture, it's a hole that lets light in. Big window, little window. Yeah, And F1.7 is a very big hole effectively this lets a lot more light in so the effects on shutter speed faster shutter speed less risk of blur blur motion slower shutter speed more risk of blur so low aperture f1.7 gives us a much more light coming through it doesn't because the scope is uh, has a fixed aperture and you can't change that up unless you change the magnification but you're tricking the camera into thinking that it's f1.7 so every time that you go up or down one, you half or double the amount of light that's coming through. Yeah, so F1.4 to F2 is half as much light. The, the surface area is 50% larger every time. So if we're at F1.56, we're all the way down here and our aperture's somewhere here, somewhere here for F1.7, so. That's why we're do, doing it with the, with the lens in front of the camera. Lower, we'll talk about ISO, more ISO. Um, ISO is the amount of energy that's going to the sensor. The, the more energy that's going to the sensor, the more photons the, the, the sensor will gather and uh, reproduce on the sensor. However, more energy means more noise. And that's, by noise, in this case, we're talking about the little stipples, the characteristics that you get of a lens on, the, on your image. Uh, so the more ISO, so if you're at 3200 ISO, you're going to be generating more energy, more stipples on your image, potentially. It's a bit of a mute point these days. As I've said, most of the uh, noise in that type of noise can be eradicated in, in post-processing. If we go back up one, that's the PA7. That's just the bod camera body and the, the adapter. Uh, 25 by magnification, you've got an aperture of f 12.5 so we go back to our table here f 12.5 is all the way down here your effective aperture is f 12.5 it's uh letting a lot less light in than all the way up here at f 1.7 that's why there's a, a preference for shooting in this way with uh 
your camera, a lens, and then an adapter in between. Um, you can shoot with just your body in it and um, an adapter straight away onto the eyepiece. It's not that that's wrong. It's just that it's better suited for full frame cameras, for instance, who will have a much better performance with higher ISOs than what the smaller cameras will. So if you've got a full frame camera and you put a TSM PA7 on, that's fine. You, you'll have no problems with that. So, but the preference is for a lens in between. Once you understand scope's aperture, you can shoot in manual mode. You know now that there's uh, f5.6, there's less light coming through than what there is at f1.7. F1 However, there's some speculation as to whether the f1.7 lens is sharper at f5.6. Logically, it should be. Uh, logically, uh, you should probably be shooting in manual mode anyway for a lot of things because it's just good practice for photography anyway. So if you want to shoot in manual mode, that's how, that's once you understand that aperture, you, you can start doing that. So micro four thirds cameras, F 1.7 is king. Why? It's small form. It's good price. It's adaptability and it's just a cracking thing for Digiscope. And it just is. It's a fantastic piece of kit. Um, yeah. And there's a couple of uh, examples of that with uh, the DA 10 and the Dimensity 4 and then it's on that, the Digiscoping adapter. Uh, yeah, and we're actually going to leave it there because we've uh, ran on for quite a while. Uh, as stated, I want to do a couple of follow-ups from this. They'll be coming over a couple of weeks and then a couple of weeks after that. So if people want more information on, like for instance, putting, uh, yeah, vid uh, video, we'll probably be doing something on video editing, but also uh, videoing with the scopes or uh, photo editing and uh, troubleshooting with your images that you're getting. So uh, if you have images that are blurred in a particular way or uh, what effect the weather conditions have, we can go into that in, into a, a, a next uh, workshop and we can talk about all that kind of stuff. And I can show you some of my mistakes. I'll be very, very honest and uh, open and I'll show you a lot of the junk that I've uh, specially saved. Uh, uh, and uh, we can that, uh, sh share that with you guys. If you need to contact me personally, I'm on Twitter, Simon Brumby, Instagram.com at Beans or Gold, and obviously on, on Facebook, uh, it's there. And my YouTube channel is Go Digiscoping. Uh, that's one word, Go Digiscoping. Uh, just go like subscribe. There's a whole bunch of resources on there for Digiscopers. Uh, some great interviews I did with some real classic, some of my heroes uh, when we went to the Digiscoping gathering in uh, in uh, Florida some some years ago now. That's where the first place where we met Robert and so forth. Uh, yeah, so that would be awesome. And the last plate is for you, Jeff. All right. Thank you. I just want to go over a couple things. Um, of course, as always, uh, we've as something new, we have live stream this as well on our uh, Facebook page at Koa Sporting Optics. Um, but also we have our YouTube page that you can check out all of our past webinars. Um, and there were, before we even started with webinars, there was over a hundred um, informational videos showing um, very thorough product use of all the Koa products. Um, there's all our social media pages, Twitter, uh, Instagram down below, but um, one other thing I want to mention is the hashtag Koa scoping. So this is something new. Um, if you use the hashtag Koa scoping, if you're out there with a Koa scope taking images uh, on Twitter, um, Instagram, and Facebook, we're going to be starting sort of a um, uh, a fan page and free um, showing people uh, some of your photos, sharing them there, um, and maybe get the opportunity to win a prize. We'll see. We'll just be doing that at random, but uh, we'll have more information on, on that um, on our Facebook page as well. And otherwise, um, look forward to talking to all of you again next Saturday. Thank you, Simon. Um, You're welcome. We've been answering most of the questions, I think, along the way. Um, so if you have other questions, you can also reach out to us at customer service at koa.com. So uh, we will definitely take you up, Simon, on your offer for video editing for post-processing. Uh, we did have a question on, on, on the histograms, so we'll do that on a, another uh, separate. Um, yeah, great, great. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot to, to learn here, a lot to 
chew on. <laughs> Yeah, I hope everybody uh, managed to get through it. There was an awful lot to do, but uh, it's obviously something that's really close to my heart and everybody else who's here, it's close to their hearts as well. And to put it into, you know, 40 minutes is, yeah, not really possible. So, yeah, if we can split split it up and people want this enthusiasm for it, we can do some more stuff, do some more coaching and some um, like uh, live workshops and things like that if people want to. I'm, I'm totally up for that. So we're giving back to the community it's uh, it's what it's all about so Perfect. yeah yeah uh, thanks everyone thanks everybody for coming and uh yeah it's really appreciate it and if you can and have the time to go to like uh, uh instagram and follow uh at, at beans or gold that would be really cool uh, so yeah cool yeah all right well with that i guess we'll sign out um again hit us with any of your follow-up questions and uh thank you all for coming once again and uh visiting on this very informative uh, presentation by Simon. Thanks again. Thanks everyone. Stay safe. You too.